I'm here to talk about something that you're all very familiar with, cars. You know the good, you know the bad. And I'm here to talk about how to go beyond cars. Now, you're all very familiar with cars, of course, and there's a lot of good about cars, a lot that's great. It's really created the potential for us to be able to go from here to almost anywhere, to interact with people, activities, make new friends, join new activities, to get there in privacy uh, very quickly, very efficiently, at relatively high speed. And that's the good news. In fact, it's been so successful, and it's worked so well, that now cars have essentially vanquished transit and all other modes of travel. In the United States today, transit only accounts for about 2% of passenger travel. 2%. Now, transit plays a very important role in certain situations, especially getting people Mostly, it's just to get people to downtown areas for commute, commuting to work. It's used by some other people, others that don't have access to cars for some reason. But it's vanquished it. And, and cars, you know, for an audience here in California is especially relevant because it's here in California and L.A. especially where cars pioneered car-dependent living, car-dependent cities. Los Angeles grew up around cars. Los Angeles had, in the late 1920s, one car for every three people. In Europe, they didn't get to that level until 50 years later. So, you know, we are here at the, the heart <laughs> where it was all pioneered. And so now we need to figure out how to go to the next step. Uh, where do we go from here? So what we've created, though, is essentially a car monoculture. Cars, as I said, have vanquished all other modes. You get up in the morning, you're going off to work or wherever you're going, you generally, for most of us, we don't even think about how we're going to get there. We just walk out to the driveway, get in the car. We don't think about choices. And in fact, for the most part, we don't have choices. So we've created this monoculture. And, and, and as I said, it's worse in the U.S. and in California especially uh, than anywhere else. Now, this monoculture has high costs. And that's the part you're all familiar with. Huge amounts of energy, <clears throat> all, that <clears throat> all that imported oil, carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases, air pollution, takes up huge amounts of space. All these roads we've built have broken up habitats and have really had a very destructive impact on a lot of our ecosystems. And, you know, bringing it back to us personally, it's hugely expensive. We spend, on average, for every car we own, we spend $8,500 per year to own and operate that vehicle. Go back and do a little calculation. Now, that includes depreciation, you know, fuel, parking, tire repair, tire replacement, and so on. $8,500. So, as we think about moving to the future, you think about these high costs. Okay, so, the question is, you know, how do, how do we move to the next step? And so what I'm going to be mostly talking about, what that next step is. But to set the stage a little more, if you think about transportation, it's arguably the least innovative sector in our society. Think about it. In a functional way, it hasn't changed in 80 years. Cars are functionally the same. Cars are, of course, much higher quality. They're safer and more comfortable. But basically, they have four wheels, they travel about the same speed. They hold the same amount of people. The fuel consumption is just a little bit better. It's going to get better in the future, but right now, just a tiny bit better than it was in the past. And mass transit really is the same story. Buses, they haven't changed. Yes, we have air conditioning. They're a little more comfortable. 
but basically, you know, it's still same capacity, same speed. So functionally, our transportation has barely changed in terms of the quality of service that it provides to us. And that's kind of shocking just by itself. But here we are in Northern California, right next to Silicon Valley. And we've seen what's happened, you know, how rapidly technologies have changed. The information technology revolution has swept through many industries and sectors of our society, transforming them. And yet here we are in transportation, you know, with essentially the same system that we've had for many, many decades. Okay, so looking forward, the core technology for really transforming transportation is something we're all very familiar with. In fact, it came out of Silicon Valley. It's information and communication technologies. Now, you say, well, we have them in transportation, but how are they really used? I mean, really, all we've done is we've used them for GPS navigation in our vehicles. So it's replaced paper maps, and that's an improvement, and that's good. But it's really not a major improvement in terms of transforming or making it significantly better. In transit, yes, we know when the next train is going to arrive, but that's about it. You have OnStar, so they give you, in the GM cars, they give you a little more information. But basically, we haven't incorporated it. So that's, that's what we need to do. We need to bring these information communication technologies into transportation. So what does that mean? How do we do it? What are we talking about? So let me go through just a set of these kinds of new mobility services. One would be what we used to call dial-a-ride. And this is more technically demand-responsive transit. And that is you use your smartphone or your internet connection and you just call up and you say, okay, I'm here, at, here I am, and actually with GPS they know where you are, and I just want to go, you know, tell them where you want to go and a vehicle would be routed to come pick you up and take you where you wanted to, wanted to go. And yes, it would take a, few, a little longer than if you had your own car, you know, maybe, depending on uh, various circumstances, and, but it would take you a little longer, but there you have the privacy, you're in the, this vehicle, you can read, you can text, you can sleep. In the end, wouldn't we rather be chauffeured do we really have the optimal transportation system now? I mean, yes, a few of you, you know, especially some of the guys like to, you know, have their high performance vehicle and, you know, like to drive around. But most of us would rather be chauffeured in the end. Another piece of this, so you can do this with information technologies. You can have it either where you call up and, it, you know, the vehicle that's near you can come and pick you up or you can have it more centrally uh, uh, managed. So then another service would be car sharing. So Zipcar and there is the largest company that exists now. There's other smaller ones also. The reason why that is so attractive to us is because wouldn't you really rather have a larger access to a larger suite of vehicles? I mean, sometimes you do want an SUV to drive up to go skiing in the mountains. Other times you might want to have a little sports car just to take drive you know, out on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. Some days you might want to have a pickup truck to go deliver a sofa to your kid that just got a new apartment. All right, so there's all kinds... There's, all kind, there's a whole set of vehicles that if we had access to them would actually be superior. And ideally, or where we're headed with a zip car type car sharing, is that would be these pods of vehicles every few blocks. Not only in the city, but in suburban areas. And they'd have a mix of different vehicles. And with wireless technologies, you just swipe a car and reserve it, and it's very, all very easy to do. And if you have enough of these, then it really provides an alternative. So where I'm going with this is that when you start getting this larger suite of services, you don't need all these cars, this, the fleet of cars. You know, on average, we have two and a half or so cars per household. And most of the time, they're just sitting there. But oftentimes, we're using, you know, the big SUV for a two-mile trip, using huge amounts of energy, space, and so on. 
Another service would be what we technically call dynamic ride sharing or smart carpooling. And this is where, um, well, think back to your college days. Bulletin boards at the college. You're going home for the weekend. Everyone just lists you know, their name and where they're going. So now you just digitize it, you know, put it all together, and make it very easily accessible. And so this can be used for routine travel. It, again, if you know your neighbors are going to a ball game or a concert, or just going to work about the same time, many of us would be willing to share that ride. But we don't know it. We don't have that information. I mean, don't we often end up at events where there's our friends and neighbors, and if we only knew they were going, we would have shared it? So that's dynamic ride sharing. Another piece of it would be uh, neighborhood cars, neighborhood electric cars, little tiny cars that, you know, when we get rid of the, all those bigger cars, so because we have access to all these other services, we don't, need, we don't need to have our own car. We could have just a little neighborhood car for just driving around the neighborhood. Now, a little fix we'd need for that is we'd have to make sure cars are safe for these vehicles. So right now, all part of the monoculture is that all cars and all roads serve all purposes. We don't specialize. Why can't we specialize our roads a little more? as well as our cars, okay? So here we have this transportation system, you know, with the little cars, the carpooling, the demand response at transit. Uh, we need to fix the land use a little bit more. You know, right now, all the incentives for cities are to encourage sp sprawl. They'd rather have a car dealership than an apartment complex because the car dealership gives them a lot of money back through sales tax, whereas an apartment just costs them a lot of money. They've got to provide all those health services and education and, and uh, water and, and all those expensive things. So here we end up with this, uh, the potential for this more complex, interesting transportation system that doesn't depend on cars, that is much cheaper because we're not paying $8,500. If you gave me $8,500 for each car you own, I'm sure I could create a transportation system, a set of mobility services that would be better, cheaper, and, and preferable to you, that you'd do it. The problem is getting how to get from here to there. And right now, no one of these services can compete with a car by itself. You know, part of it is there's so much inertia, we're so used to doing things the way we've done it. Uh, you know, there's the comic strip Pogo from the 70s, you might have heard of. Pogo said, I have seen the enemy and he is us. So part of it is us, we need to become more open, think about these other options. The other part is there are so many barriers to all of these companies that are providing these services whether there's peer-to-peer -peer car sharing where you can l let other people use your car, but there's all, all kinds of risks on insurance and you gotta pay money. There's problem with these demand responsive transit that, that taxi monopolies don't want competition, so they block uh, the, the licensing allowance of these other services. Even transit suppliers tend to not want competition. They also behave often as monopolies and they've been, you know, they need money, they starve, so they're not very creative anymore. They don't have the bandwidth to try out new things. And so we have all these barriers, but yet, even with all these problems, all these difficult, there are a lot of these small startup companies providing these services. Everything I talked to you about exists. There are companies providing all of these services, but they're all startups. And the problem is getting from here to there and scaling them up in the competition, and they need, you need to have sets of these uh, mobility companies and services all together in one place for it to really work. So that's where we are. Uh, there's some hope uh, as we move to the future. Um, you know, we need more innovation, we need more entrepreneurship, we need to remove, remove barriers, we need champions. That's when something we really need. Um, so in the end, what we need mostly is choice. And isn't that the most American thing possible? Thank you. <laughs>